Hey guys, uh, welcome back to another episode of the Typical Skeptic Podcast. I have a legend with me today. I have with me Brett Rains. He um, I, and we will have Martin Powell with us too. Martin's going to be a little bit late. He's going to be joining us, but I figured since I have the opportunity to interview Brent just alone, I might as well because he's really a legend in ufology, and I I love picking his brain about these topics. Uh, Brent's written books on John Keel and other stuff. Uh, let me just read you his bio. Brent, who's been researching and investigating the unexplained since January 1967 at age 14, and is the author of Visitors of Hidden Realms, On the Edge of Reality, and John Keel, Man, Myths, and Ongoing Mysteries. Brent edits and publishes Alternate Perceptions Magazine, and also the Facebook group, Alternate Perceptions, where you guys know I kind of post a lot of my stuff, um, which was established in 1985 and is now available as an online publication. And I want to welcome Brent to the show. Brent, thanks for coming back on. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, thank you, Robert. Um, I I'm just learned I was a legend. How about that? I didn't know that. So anyway, <laughs> uh, appreciate the uh, the invitation. Uh, always good to talk with you. Yeah, it's great. So um, I guess we could talk about like maybe some of your book or what, what you've been researching first. Well, let me ask you this. What do you think of all the stuff that's going on with the government and disclosure? Like, I mean, have you been following that at all? And like, what do you what do you think about? I mean, it's, it's pretty interesting, huh? Well, it's, it's hard to miss. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of a uh, lot of uh, media attention on that right now. That's for sure. And I I. Um, I did send some information uh, a few weeks ago. I hadn't heard anything back to uh, term Tim Burchett here in over here in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, who's a U.S. congressman and was spearheading the recent uh, back in August, the uh, UFO hearing with uh, three different you know witnesses uh, to, you know, claiming various various things uh, from uh, knowledge of information that was uh, being concealed to uh actual personal observations of uh ufo or ufo or uap if you prefer <laughs> uh you know sightings themselves uh you know being in the military but uh a lot of this you know it's kind of surprising the the turnaround on the uh, narrative that uh that we hear in recent years because in the past we had all these reports uh, of military personnel seeing things going back to the, you know, the 1940s, 1950s, and so on. And uh, we were always told there was no threat to national security. And, you know, they were all just generally natural phenomena that people were mistaken about. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, you know, I just think it's uh, just more confirmation that there's something out there. Some of it's, of course, going to be, you know, things that are misidentified. A lot of it, I'm sure, but then there's those court cases that uh, do need to be examined. So I was just, you know, doing my part by contacting Tim Burchett was, you know, the Cash Lundrum case, and another one that uh, came to my attention from a researcher known as Tommy Long to um, um, see what uh, you know they might probe into some of these cases a little deeper if you know they they're so inclined. Yeah. So anyway. I think Martin's here. Martin, do you, can you hear us? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, good. Uh, uh, you do. I can't. I can hear you, but I can't see you. Yeah. Uh, Brent knows about this. <laughs> Lately, I've been upside down somehow in 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 the videos. So it's probably best just to leave it blank for now. Oh, I, we were kind of getting in before we get into the Calvin Parker stuff. I was asking Brent like. His, uh, his uh, you know, take on UFOs since he's been researching for so long, and we were kind of getting into mm -hmm. that. Um, I, yeah. I just want to like finish this thought before we get into the Calvin Parker stuff. So you said you sure. said with Brent the, the the Cash Landrum case that was a big case, right? And and, right. and and these are verifiable abduction cases that you know of. Is that <clears throat> is that correct? Well, they they uh, you know they appear credible. Uh, a good number of them that are they're perplexing i mean there are uh, a few years ago i interviewed uh from my online magazine uh, albert rosales in, in miami florida uh who is collecting all sorts of landing reports and and occupant or entity cases 
associated with strange lights and objects that have landed or are close encounters. He's concentrated on that. And, and at the time when I interviewed him, uh, maybe six years ago, there was like uh, he had about 17,000 cases worldwide. And so there are a lot of, you know, of these reports out there and uh, they are quite, quite puzzling. And I, I need to correct myself. I said Tommy Long. It's, it's, it's uh, Tommy Bland. <laughs> I don't know where I come up with Long there, but that was the name of the researcher. He's been involved in, in uh, these uh, UFO investigations for a long, long time. Um, and uh, anyway, he uh, witnessed back, uh, oh, let's see, sometime in the 1970s, there was a massive wave out in his area of Texas at the time. And uh, he and, and uh, his wife and a news reporter, uh, an actual editor from a local paper, uh, observed uh, two objects, one that actually uh, descended into a river and another one that seemed to be accompanied by uh, military aircraft, uh, including at least one helicopter. And uh, the newspaper editor checked and found out that it appeared to the helicopters, military aircraft appeared to originate from the same airfield as in the Cash Lundrum case uh, several years later. And um, interesting. That's really so it would be interesting. interesting. I thought it'd be real interesting if the UFO hearing people, uh, <laughs> Tim Burchett is spearheading, if they if they went ahead and um, followed up on that, you know, made some inquiries. But I haven't heard anything back. But yeah. Anyway, well, 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 one last one last question for you before we get into the, the Calvin Parker stuff. And I introduced Martin is do you, and this might be a long winded question because it's 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 so in depth. But like. Do, do you think that these things could be possibly interdimensional as compared to um, uh, extraterrestrial? Because it just it just seems it seems more plausible. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot they say that NASA lies to us about. So, you know, I always keep that in my back pocket that, like, maybe there might be life on other planets that NASA isn't telling us about. You know, but also and, and, and then we hear, you know, stuff about the secret space program. I have witnesses on this supposedly they're you know I, I i don't know how credible they are I, I just let people you know tell their story and stuff you know but i mean like so I, i'd love to know what your thoughts on because i know you were a big keel fan and i thought keel thought that they were like ultra terrestrials right yeah he thought they were an earth-based phenomena by and large he couldn't totally dismiss um you know the extraterrestrial thing but um and i, I kind of think that you know there's so many different descriptions of the, the beings and, and uh, they seem to be, um, you know, I, I kind of can think of it in terms I recently expressed it as kind of like a lot of these manifestations, a lot of these perceptions are like a, a theater of the mind. And it's like, who is the projectionist or as the late uh, Rosemary Ellen Guiley said, uh, who is the Oz behind the curtain? You know, there seems to be like a control system, as Jacques Vallée said, uh, there's something that generates maybe the experience. Uh, some of it comes from our subconscious minds, I suppose, from our culture or uh, religious backgrounds or whatever. And uh, in fact, John Keel had suggested uh, to me uh, back when I was a teenager writing to him that if I really wanted to get out in the field, investigate, I should uh, familiarize myself with uh, uh, visionary phenomena, religious uh, apparitions and visions and things of that nature, that they were just a variation on on a lot of the contact cases that we have. And, and that was something I was quite interested in was, uh, you know, um, what the mechanisms were, the, you know, what, uh, what that was all about. Even though I can't really say for sure uh, <laughs> what the origin is, there's just a lot of similarities. Uh, I know Keel had said, and I feel strongly about that, that um, ufology should be a branch of parapsychology. There are certainly a lot of psychic elements that crop up. The entities often communicate telepathically. And a lot of these, uh, you know, we see the object at a distance. It appears to be a strange lighter craft, but the closer it gets, the more, as uh, uh, Je Jenny Randall over in England calls it, it becomes uh, more the Oz effect. You know, these all these strange perceptions of the... Uh, you know, introduced in some way psychically uh, and sometimes the physical effects uh, to the experiencer. And uh, 
and 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 there's so many different uh, places they originate. So many different stories that were given. Uh, you know, there's uh, there's a lack of consistency. You know, so yeah. But well, you know, what was interesting, and I'd love to get your opinion on this, Martin. And then I'll give you a proper introduction too. I, 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 sure. I, I listened to a, a an episode of Whitley Strieber's Dreamland, and he was saying that this was the one of the most interesting cases. You guys both got to hear this. It's it's amazing. It's called um about abductions in Bali. And it reminded me a little bit of what was going on in Peru recently. Like, well, the Peru thing was very interesting because they were calling those aliens face peelers. I don't know if you guys saw the news on that, but it was it was coming up everywhere that there were these aliens attacking people in Peru. Well, then I was doing some research because I, I would always like to listen to old radio. And I was listening to an episode of Whitley Schreiber's Dreamland and I found out about this guy, Alan Lammers, his name is, and I can't track this guy down for anything, but like supposedly this guy, Alan Lammers went to Bali. This was on an episode of Dreamland again. And he went to Bali to set up radio communications because I guess they have a problem with like their local logging system there. So to get the government involved, they, 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 they create radio stations to get the word out. And then they feel it makes the government feel like they have to do something. Well, anyway, this Lammers guy went, went over there to Bali and he, he, he started noticing some very weird things. Like he was told that you can't wear color in the jungle. Um, and a guy did wear color and he got bit and he couldn't, couldn't tell what he got bit by. He got bit by something invisible. Then the story, I'm just making a long story short. And he got bit by something and he barely made it overnight. He was like, you know, projectile vomiting and stuff like that. But then, um, then they found out some weirder things. They found out about these creatures that, that, that like reminded them of alien greys that like live there in the jungle. And they they take people sometimes and they, they heal them, but sometimes they take them and they don't bring them back, which was so strange to me. But it made me think that maybe we're dealing with something that's like an inner earth type being. Like, I, maybe, maybe, I mean, I, fe I feel like there's so many parts of the world that are undiscovered that maybe there are some weird things living in our earth or maybe they're from inner earth or I don't know. I'd love to get both you guys opinions on that. Wow. Um, <laughs> go ahead, Brent. <laughs> wow. Um, and, well, and, uh, and, and also before you go, Brent, and, and how that tie might tie into the stuff that was going on in Peru. If you heard about the alien attacks in Peru, if they were real, you know, sorry. Yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I know that, um, yeah, Peru and a lot of the other South American countries have have had a lot of activity. Um, you know, the uh, Brazil has had. Uh, you know, I got to interview um, uh, uh, Bob Pratt, who wrote a book on on uh, the Brazilian cases that he he uh, made fourteen trips to Brazil uh, during his lifetime. I interviewed him about a month after his fourteenth one, his last one. And I'd met him back uh, about a year after he really got involved in investigating these the uh, UFO uh, cases for the National Enquirer. And no matter what you say about the National Enquirer, they were big on UFOs, and they did send their reporters all over the globe. And uh, he went to Brazil on four occasions for them. Um, and... Uh, and then the other 10 times he went, he would get an interpreter because the language is mainly Portuguese down there. And you've got to have someone who can, you know, talk with the people for you. And uh, there was uh, there were there were more cases he found. there. most of them, of course, there's no injury, but there were some uh, in stark contrast to other locations he went to around the world and here in America. There were these injury cases, and one in particular that really seemed quite credible, and Jacques Vallée describes this. He went down there um, and is described in his book, Confrontations, and he interviewed as well as Bob Pratt, the, um, the medical doctor on this island at the mouth of the Amazon in Brazil, and they were having all kinds of UFO sightings. Uh, civilian reporters were on the island as well as military and they were photographing, filming these things. And uh, Jacques Vallée states in confrontation that um, the uh, he discovered that uh, some American firm he was told was had gone around and purchased all of the uh, negatives of the objects that civilian reporters had had photographed. And uh, 
he concluded that someone here in the United States has, <laughs> whoever that someone is, uh, has all the, the this very impressive body of evidence. But there were um, a good three dozen people on this island who were injured, um, struck by beams of light that um, made them very sick. Two people died and um, maybe from complicated, I think one was a heart attack. And, uh, and you know, at first the, the, the doctor there, a female doctor, she thought that this was all just uh, part of some, uh, uh, you know, superstition that the natives had until the report, you know, the, her patients kept coming in and they exhibited uh, all these uh, various si symptoms, usually within about, I think, five days to a week, they, they would recover. Uh, but before that, they were quite ill and they had a high white cell count and they had these on their chest would be kind of like these uh, uh, burns. They said that be struck by the burn was like being struck by uh, having a cigarette, a uh, lighted cigarette put on your chest and there would be some some blood there. And um, and then one day the, the, the uh, doctor saw one of the things going down the main street, a kind of a cylindrical type craft and she would just mesmerized it and mesmerized by it and just walked along down the street with this thing just uh very low altitude uh slowly moving over the village and uh so i know that that's a pretty well authenticated uh case uh and uh i know that even to this day uh people like uh jacques valley still talks about it in a recent discussion uh with like Gary Nolan and uh, Christopher Christopher Kit Green of the you know the, formerly the CIA uh, who worked uh, with Stanford Research Institute on all the remote viewing and uh, projects and things kind of overseeing that and um, so anyway um, and as for Peru yeah they they've still got like almost a lot of them the 1950s um, uh, type contact stories going on down there they have had. Uh, so I mean it's uh but every once in a while the the bad boys show up. Uh it's uh it's just a uh a mixed bag of things that that you come across. Anyway. Yeah, and, and Martin, before I introduce you, before you go ahead and speak, I just wanted to give you a proper introduction to guys. To, uh, today, I also have with me Martin Powell. He's the author of hundreds of science fiction, mystery, and horror stories. He's worked on comic book industry since 1986, writing for Marvel, DC, Malibu, Caliber, Moonstone, and Disney, among others. He's been nominated for a coveted Eisner Award. Martin also writes children's books and frequently contributes prose to many short story and short anthologies. And he lives in Alabama, USA. And uh, he's here today. Him and Brent are actually here to talk about uh, the book called that they that that Martin illustrated. It's called The Closest Encounter on Flying Dip Disc Press by Philip Mantle about the Calvin Parker case. But um, did you before we get in? And thank you for joining me, Martin. But did before I we get into that, did you want to answer this like to what your thoughts on the alien encounters were and stuff like the other the other ones that we've been hearing about? Sure. Um, uh, <clears throat> just small correction about the graphic novel. I wrote it. Didn't didn't illustrate it. Uh, it was oh. illustrated by uh, Jason Gleaves. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, that's no problem whatsoever. Uh, but I just thought I'd make that clear because uh, Jason did a wonderful job, and I want everybody to know uh, to know that. Um, as far as the uh, the alien stuff, like in Peru and Brazil, Brent and I have talked about this a lot between ourselves. And uh, it's, it's, it's one of the most fascinating parts of, of the phenomenon to me because it's so different than what we have here in the United States in terms of it's just, it, it l largely seems to be rather vicious. Um, it's, it's almost like it's purposely trying to hurt people, but yet they're not hurt as much. And I, and I always need to stress this to people so they understand these, the people that are being hurt aren't nearly being hurt as much as they are by other people if you know what I mean. Um, no you one's mean like my lab abductions? Well, there, well, there are people, you know, like, like Brent said, there are a couple of people have died from it, uh, from, from these encounters, but um, who knows what the real reason for that was. It could have been a complication of some infection or something like that from, from the actual contact, who knows. 
But I'm just saying, like, with what's going on in the Middle East right now, we're being a lot more cruel to each other than whatever this is. It seems to be kind of mean and, and vicious, but yet it could do so much more harm. Uh, obviously. I, I agree. But like, did you what did you think of that story I told you about what's going on in Bali, too, or what 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 they reported was going on in Bali? Like, yeah. there might be these inner earth beings like I, I find that very strange. It makes me think that maybe we're dealing with something that might be from inner earth or, or maybe interdimensional that can come into our reality when it chooses to and when it doesn't choose to. And then it takes people when it wants to. And then it 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 heals them sometimes too that maybe that's one part i left out they they were actually healing people too with yes. people that got injured but then they would take people too almost like they control the situation i i find that fascinating right i it that's it's it reminded me when i heard about it it reminded me a bit of the the shaver mystery you know um of uh, the the darrows and the uh, the these uh uh, monsters that live apparently somewhere beneath the surface of the earth, which, you know, large people, a lot of people these days have discounted as just something, you know, fictitious that uh, Ray Palmer uh, had, had created um, himself. But uh, I don't know, as far as doing, you know, if, if it's, if it's real, and I'm not saying that it is, but if it is, uh, it, it sounds to me almost more like, the way it's behaving like the old um the old fairy tales the old fairy stories you know gnomes and uh, elves and and that kind of thing that which a lot of times did come from below the you know below the uh below the ground and uh often abducted people too and sometimes they helped people and sometimes they did not sometimes they did some bad things um jock Valley has mentioned two several cases where people have been uh, it's been documented that they've been healed in situations like this, uh, but there's also been people hurt. You know, it's 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 a very complicated thing. It's very it's very complex. Uh, I don't think it's per, for me personally. I don't really know what's going on, so I'll, so I just hazard a kind of a surmise that to me it just seems like it's kind of um, it's not positive or negative. It's just what it is. You know, I don't I don't think it's it doesn't seem to be something evil, and I don't think it's something. Uh, all sweetness and light either it's just kind of what it is it, i think it has its own agenda and um you know sometimes we get in the way of it perhaps maybe that's why some people get hurt well that, that's what i wanted to ask you guys next real quick uh, before we get into the calvin parker stuff i figured since i have two ufo experts with me i might as well shoot the breeze with you guys about the alien phenomenon and ufos i wanted to ask you guys about the missing 411 as well what do you, and what do you, mm. what do you think about that because I find that fascinating as well. It's like people are, you know, showing up missing all over the place. But then, you know, like David Polites, he never wanted to connect it to the alien phenomenon for a long time. But then in his most recent film, he he starts to. He starts to like draw conclusions that there were UFO sightings around the time that this person went missing and blah, blah, blah. I don't know if you guys saw that or if you guys have a theory um, and I'd love to get each of your opinions on what you think about the missing 411. Go ahead, Brent. Oh, darn. <laughs> 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 you know, to me, there are no experts, no real um, authority figures in the UFO yeah. field. There are I people, feel that way, too. You know, there are people who just, um, uh, we just do the best we can. The only, only, only area that would really be authority in is, as if, say, uh, I was an authority figure in photography, could analyze photographic images of of UFOs, or maybe I was um, some other area, uh, psychotherapy or something, or I was an engineer, and I could just address the aspects uh, relating to uh, things that people had reported or any kind of physical trace evidence or something, or maybe a chemical analyst. But uh, <clears throat> I don't know, the... the um, it's almost uh, people have talked about the trickster element of a lot of these phenomena. And, and I think the only way that the trickster element sometimes uh, can help us if we realize that the trickster is one that uh, can mislead and that we don't necessarily have uh, should uh, believe everything we hear. Uh, it's there to teach us maybe to be more discerning. And it is as as Martin just said, a very complex phenomenon. And I'm very, very cautious about what I say about it. Um, 
I'm not trying to tell the phenomena what it is. It's uh, it's up to it to address that with us. Um, you know, uh, Jacques Vallée tackled the story of little people, uh, religious phenomena back in 1969 and in his passport to Magonia, which I, I, I really, uh, that blew my mind when I was reading that book years ago. Yeah, me and, too. Uh, you know, and, and then you throw John Keel in on top of that the following year with Strange Creatures from Time and Space and and uh, and uh, Operation Trojan Huss. And, and I I talked to a, a gentleman who he and his wife uh, went down to Mexico and uh, there was a place he was working with uh, the National Enquirer. I mean, uh, National Geographic. Uh, there's a difference there. Uh, <laughs> National Geographic. And he said that there were these stories of these uh, little people who uh, people were seeing, and they were uh, also, um, there were these old ancient ruins. And one day, um, I think a couple of people he was, this guy was working with, he told me he was a photographer and a film a filmmaker, uh, said they just jokingly, they took one of the local uh, guides and uh tried to drag him into this cave and the guy was just hysterical you know and they had to let him go because you know they, they thought it was a joke they, they believe they came you know the little people came from underground um and uh you know i don't know it's uh there's so many things that have been told and so many things that uh not just in our time but historically one well, maybe one of the greatest uh UFO cases was Fatima Portugal back on October 13th, uh, 1917. You know, uh, both Keel and, and Jacques Vallée wrote quite a bit about uh, that and, and, and some of their uh, their books. And uh, I mean, here you had um, maybe 70,000 witnesses gathered and seeing this dance of the sun this spinning disc that they assumed was the the sun it was going to crash on them and there were all these unusual colors and they had just been rain just before that before the clouds opened up and this disc was there and um they were um suddenly the ground was dry their clothes were dry and uh there was also this stuff like kind of like the angel's hair that we have in in um uh, particularly back in the 1950s and, and 60s. We had a lot of reports of that. Uh, sometimes they turned out to be spider webs. Um, but on the other hand, there was some that were just very, very strange. They would just seem to evaporate. And there was a photograph of um, some angel's hair uh, around Fatima, Portugal, back as you know, recently as 1957. So there, and there were other instances of, of, uh, these type of phenomena over in, in the region there uh, of Portugal and surrounding other places in, in Europe of, of uh, kind of the dance of the sun. In fact, one of the, one of the popes in Rome had, uh, had such an experience in Rome. So I don't know, there's, you know, Keel's, I keep thinking about what Keel had told me and what he wrote about uh, making all these comparisons between these various uh, religious and mystical phenomena of the past and and looking at what's happening today um of course back in the past we had more of a a spiritual um you know take on it um although even today uh we have um uh, you know um a lot of cases that are coming up that people are connecting a, a spiritual belief about um and you know we have healings and we have uh uh, a lot of spiritual type messages and channelings and things that people describe. So anyway, uh, so I'm taking up too much time. So I'll let, <laughs> better let Martin in there. To... No, this is all great stuff. This is a, this is what I love. This is why I love doing this. So no, it's it's fine. But uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Martin. Um. Yeah. The 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 Fatima thing has always mystified me too in that regard because I remember uh, I went to. I went to uh, Catholic school growing up, and of course we we were taught about the miracle as a religious um, phenomenon, you know, a religious 
uh, well, a miraculous event. But I can remember, like, I think I was maybe the fourth or fifth grade. Even then, I remember thinking, well, that kind of sounds like, you know, it might have been a flying saucer or something. Um, and then, too, uh, I remember uh, during one little Bible study, it was, there was a, uh, and I've forgotten exactly where it is in the Bible, but there's an angel described uh, physically, which are very different than the way people generally think angels should look. Uh, it's basically described as kind of a wheel that has eyes all around it and four pairs of wings and things like that. And which to me kind of sounded like, again, a flying saucer, maybe with portholes, you know, and uh, what would somebody 5,000 years ago think if they saw something like that? You know, they would have no, no, uh, no reference of thinking it to be some kind of vehicle. I don't think certainly. Um, so uh, even back then I was kind of, wondering about about that too and then once by the time that i discovered john keel you know i was like wow you know he he just uh brought so many of, of the, the of those individual threads together um that uh, i i still think the between between keel and jacques Vallee, i think that the, they're the ones to me that are the most on to something um and uh broad St uh, brad steiger had some had some really really good ideas too i love uh, Brad all of, I, yeah, I, I, I used yeah. to listen to his old shows with art bell back in the oh, day. He's, he, yeah he's great brad was a great guy and um all it's interesting that all three of them you know uh keel the 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 journalist brad steiger the the writer and uh jacques valet the scientist all three of them sort of view the ufo phenomenon as a paranormal thing you know not so much I mean, maybe it's extraterrestrial, but maybe it's something a lot weirder than that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which, I, I mean, I don't think anybody studying the phenomenon could say that it's not really weird because it really is. I mean, it. a lot of people who will look into it will only see kind of a certain surface of it where they think all the aliens are the little gray guys and, uh, you know, everything the scene is a flying saucer when really that's not anywhere close to to what's going on. I mean, there's been, I guess, probably, I don't know, Brent, what, what do you think, hundreds of different kinds of humanoids that have been seen? Um, um, if not thousands. I mean, it's, it's just, yeah. you know, we, we've had, and then some are like blobs and little tin cans. And yeah, I yeah. mean, <clears throat> just, you know, weird, <laughs> high weirdness. <laughs> yeah. And, and I remember um, uh, somewhere, uh, who was it that I heard say it? Um well, no, I think it was I think it was Jacques Fillet actually that uh, he was describing the occupants as he called them, and he said, you know, that in the United States anyway, everybody describes the little gray guys with the big black eyes. He said, but that's not what most people around the world are saying. You know that this seems to be more of a kind of an American thing. I, most I, people... I agree. I have to agree with that. I mean, I was going to say I, because when I interview people from Australia, mm -hmm. it, it seemed like they were having a lot different experiences than people from America. They were seeing a lot different beings. Like, I like think about the, the the case of Peter Corey, for example. I don't know if you right. guys remember that one. The yep. hair of the alien. That guy wrote yep. that book, The Hair of the Alien. That's right. a strange case, and it's uh, really you know, strange. Like, and and he had DNA evidence for it too. But what was weird was that that evidence traced back to like some kind of weird Mongolian hair, which I don't even yeah. know. Like if he could have faked that, I'm not saying because I've had Peter on my show. He seemed like an honest guy, but I'm just saying like if he, I don't see how he could have faked that. I don't see how he could have got a Mongolian hair like that. It just doesn't seem like it would be, you know. I, I don't know. Yeah, if I, I I don't know a whole lot about the case. I have read the book, his book. Um, uh, but, uh, seemed to me, didn't they say something about the, not just a M Mongolian, um, uh, base of origin for, for the DNA, but it was like ancient, you know, that went back. It was something that doesn't exist today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're exactly right. It was, it was, it was um, interesting. It was, a, it was, a, it was, a. it's cases like that that keep me up at night. Like, you know, I, I love stuff like that. I really do. Well, well, like Jacques said, he the he always made a point of saying that really, you know, there's all kinds of creatures that are that people claim to see. There's little hairy dwarfs, there's giants, there's cyclops, there's all kinds of things going on. But he said the the most common occupant that people see by far look pretty much like normal people. 
You know, yeah. there's usually something maybe a little odd about them, but otherwise they 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 could pass really for anybody else if they were in uh, you know in in normal clothing or whatever. We wouldn't really think anything about it. That's so, that's interesting. Um, I I just had um which I'm on my show last night from the Adamski Foundation. Glenn Steckling, and he was telling me that that like the human genome is like very like he thinks that the human genome is very um, common throughout the universe. You know, I don't know. Well, who can say? I mean, yeah, uh, I, yeah I I don't know if I'll ever know. I that's that, that's the kind of stuff I I'd love to know though. Yeah, but I, anyway, I guess I could get into it. the uh, this kind of segues really greatly for like talking about what we're what we're here to talk about today, which is. Uh, your book, which is the closest encounter, the Calvin Parker story. Um, what's interesting is I I got to interview Calvin myself. Like I had him on my podcast. Great guy, and I'm so yeah. I was so sad when he passed away. I uh, I posted the interview on my Facebook page, you know, and I pinned it so people could see it because I I wanted him to get credit for you know just for whatever he had went through. Um, and then I recently ha I had on Philip and Irina. I guess they wrote a book about this too. There's a lot of heat around this case. It seems like it's a pretty um, interesting and provable case. Um, I don't know. What, where did you guys want to start with that? What, where, I guess you this Mar ask you this, Martin. What, why, what made you want to write about this case? Um, well, Philip, uh, Philip Mantle, he, he's the one that approached me about it. And I do think that Philip and, and Irene, of, of, of anybody else probably in the field, are the, are the real you know, experts of this particular case. They've documented it um, uh, for so long. It's, it, I mean, they've, I don't know, there's three or four books they've written between them and together, and uh, they keep coming up with new stuff, new, uh, new evidence and new, new witnesses. It's, it's an ongoing thing, and it hasn't really slowed down. Uh, but Philip uh, was a, we were Facebook friends. I knew of him uh, by his reputation in the, in the field, and he contacted me one day out of the blue and and asked me if I would be interested in writing uh, a graphic novel um, version of Calvin's uh, biography. And, um, and I, I knew about the Calvin case and um, for actually many years, I, re I remember when it happened, I was quite a little kid, but I do remember when it happened and read, read the, uh, the accounts of it in the newspapers. I remember seeing them on, I think it was Dick Cavett's show um, and, and so on and so forth. So I was fascinated by it. And I, I didn't have to think long about giving him an answer because I, I just, f the first thing I wondered is, is, okay, Calvin's already written the book and obviously his would be the most authentic and accurate version of his own story. But I said, what, what could a graphic novel bring to it that would make it any different? And I think I thought at the time what that would be would be the visuals that we could actually, for the first time, uh, show show people, not just describe them, but show people exactly what Calvin saw and what he experienced. So he worked very closely with the, the artist Jason. Uh, they had lots of Skype uh, discussions between them. Um, Calvin would describe as closely as he could the, the entities that he saw on the ship. Uh, Jason would draw them up and Calvin would tell him what was right or what was wrong with them until they got them just right. So what you see in the book is, I think, is, is, is as close as it's ever going to be to what to what Calvin actually experienced. Um, plus, I was intrigued by the other being that's described in the story, which uh, Calvin always described as a female that was never mentioned in the in the account before. Uh, he, he always claimed before that he had fainted uh, when this was going on. And all he remembered was being dragged into the, into the craft and then waking up outside later on. But, you know, if, but years went by and he decided that, that if he was going to, that he kept reading so many accounts of, of his story that were wrong, that he felt that, that the only way he could set that straight was to write it himself. And so he uh, filled in a lot of holes that before, you know, we didn't even know we're there. Um, and so I was intrigued by that. I've always been interested in the appearance of these particular creatures, which are very unlike most close encounters. They were robotic-like, uh, in 
gray wrinkled skin, almost like mummies. Didn't seem to have eyes. Um, had these spikes kind of sticking out of the, around their heads. Claw hands like a lobster. You know, it's very, very strange. And uh, But also on the inside was a female creature that was much more humanoid looking. She was very small. Um, I think Calvin said probably about four, four and a half feet tall. Um, and and this is the weirdest part to me was that she appeared to be wearing a mask. He said, when she got close enough to him, it was a it was a woman's face, a strange looking woman. She had larger eyes than usual and kind of a a bluish complexion. I think he said, but he said the but as she got closer to him, to his face, he could tell she was wearing a mask, and I thought that was very very strange. Um, so what did she look like under the mask? You know, yeah, that's, that's bizarre. Um, Brent, what were your takeaways from this case? No, I don't know if he's there. Oh, you're muted. You, you're, you're, you're... Oh, sorry, I was I muted so that <laughs> I wouldn't. Uh, okay. While Martin was talking, I didn't want to, you know, have uh, some of the noise from here. Um, yeah, uh, back in August of 1975, I met a guy by the name of Will Jima, who claimed that he was uh, an executive shipyard worker down at Pascagoula back at that time. In fact, he was uh, at Methodist Men's Club. He was attending a meeting one time, and um, this was right afterwards, and he listened to the tape that the police made in secret that uh you know hickson and parker didn't know was was being recorded and uh to see if you know they would reveal anything that might be um indicate that this this was some kind of a hoax or something and and it didn't it showed their their um uh, you know raw emotions uh being upset by what had happened and uh talking like something really had happened to them and so he listened to that and um he said it was about two weeks afterwards that he was in the area it was about eight o'clock in the evening and he was walking along the beach by himself and he came upon three humanoid beings oriental type eyes grayish suits and uh had a mouthpiece and the skin was bluish tint to it and this was back in 1975 that he had told me this and they had blonde hair um he said he was also Throughout the experience, uh, he felt this euphoria, and he said he was a person who was uh, a very nervous type person. Uh, for him to get into a euphoria, euphoria type state, very relaxed, uh, was very uncommon for him. And uh, he was given all of these messages of things that were supposed to happen. There was supposed to have been a mass landing and never happened, and some other things. Uh, but uh, you know. He even created a uh, couple of LPs, long playing uh, records, and uh, called the UFO Message and Revelation 666 that he tried to sell. And I don't think he, he did too good on that. But uh, anyway, I just thought about, you know, before that, as Martin said, we didn't have any descriptions of this female. And here was a, one female and two males on this beach. And they communicated, you know, these things to uh, messages to him, I guess, and downloads or whatever we'd call it today. Uh, but I was, uh, you know, um, coincidence, whatever. Uh, but yeah, back at that time, it was nothing to do with, uh, you know, we didn't know about a female being associated with the case. It only came up much, much later. Uh, Kelvin Parker wanted to be. Uh, he didn't want to be a part of the case, you know. That was that was left up to Charles Hickson uh, in the beginning, uh, and I, I met him a year later at a library over in Jacksonville Beach, Florida, um, and uh, went out to lunch with him and his uh, his agent. Uh, he spoke and was telling me at that time that he felt that uh, they were robots, the beings, and uh, felt that there was something that was still ongoing he wasn't sure what i think he had weird dreams or something but um 
anyway, um, when that happened, I was in the Navy and I was in Mayport, Florida, which is near Jacksonville. Uh, my ship, the USS Paul D-1080 destroyer escort, was home ported there. And what was kind of funny is that I was sleeping in my bunk aboard ship, and um, and ordinarily there was no radio playing. The speakers were turned off unless it was some message they wanted to communicate from the bridge. And uh, I was having a dream about these strange alien beings with claw type hands. And I woke up and the radio was on and it was a news report telling about the Pascagoula case that was just being reported. And wow. so, you know, I thought, wow. So I got up, you know, got dressed, got off the ship. There were some phone booths at the, you know, on the pier. And I called the radio station and asked them for more details. And of course, pretty soon the next day, there was a uh, front line, you know, the front page uh, story about, you know, the Pascagoula case involving two two men claiming they were taken aboard a craft. And uh, so anyway, just 10 days after that, I got on a plane and flew from Jacksonville to, uh, you know, New Orleans. There was a, uh, a gentleman uh, over there, a ufologist, uh, Milton Scott. Uh, was his name originally I think was from Pennsylvania because I I come across a Salsa News uh, magazine that had his picture uh, in it when he lived around uh, Philadelphia and uh, that was that magazine was put out by Gray Barker and Jim Mosley back in the day that was around 1969 and um, I was told about him from a Ramona Clark who lived on base her husband was a sailor too and I had been trying to reach her. I remember we'd corresponded and I thought she was in Jacksonville Beach. That was what the PO was. But when I finally got in touch with her, found out she was, you know, uh, she was right there on base. So I'd go over and, and talk with her. And she told me uh, that if I wanted to go over and investigate it, that Milton Scott, who lived, I guess, about 90 or 100 miles from Pascagoula, uh, he could drive me over there. So <clears throat> that's what I did. And, uh, I got to meet Calvin uh, and uh, Charles Hickson, uh, like I say, just 10 days and visited the, uh, went under the bridge and over to the uh, the fishing dock where they said they had had the, uh, where the abduction occurred. And uh, then we headed up towards, uh, going up towards Jackson, Mississippi. Um, oh yeah, meeting uh, Hickson and Parker. Um, they gave me a newspaper. Uh, they wrote the article and they said that this was the um, accurate information on what happened to them. You know, a basic outline of the story they had that the paper newspaper there in Mississippi had allowed them to, uh, you know, put the words in their own words. And so if I wanted to know what was happening at that point, uh, it was the newspaper. It was a copy of it. So anyway, uh, that was... Uh, and then, you know, I, I had met, um, well, I, I first engaged in contact with Martin about, I guess, about three years ago, maybe, and and uh, talking about my interest and his interest, which, you know, shared all the discussion on all these different cases. And um, then he told me he was uh, working on this book, and I had told him about, you know, my, my experience looking into uh, the Pascagoula case. And uh, he invited me to uh, write an introduction, which uh, which I was honored to do, appreciate it. Um, the only other thing I could add is, uh, I think, is um, I've been in contact with a, um, a Max Edwards PhD who used to write a lot of articles for England's Flying Saucer Review. He was a, a considerably respected uh, researcher in the UFO field. Um, and he told me that there was a, a young boy up in West Calgary in uh, Canada who was crossing a field, claimed there was a buzzing sound. Um, and uh, I guess he was levitated off the ground. There was an orange beam of light that uh, struck him. And he was only 10 years old. 
and the beings fit the description of what was seen at Pascagoula. But for 10 years, um, okay, for 10 years, they kept the story under wraps. They didn't reveal the description of the beings because they hadn't ever had any other cases like it. But he said it matched the, uh, the beings of the Pascagoula case. So the boy's experience was back in the 60s sometime. Um, and they kept it under wraps for 10 years. And then 1973. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, and he was quite, uh, quite a respected and, and uh, legitimate uh, researcher and writer in the UFO field. That's so interesting. Um, uh, 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 Martin, so uh, that's amazing that you got to meet Calvin. I was going to ask you guys your takeaways from meeting Calvin. Martin, did you get a chance to meet Calvin while you were um, writing this book? And what were your takeaways from it? I never, I, I never met Calvin in person, but we, uh, we, we shared some Skypes together and uh, quite a number of emails. And um, I thought Calvin was a great guy. He was a, uh, um, it's one of one of the things that uh, whenever I see a video of him or or whatever what, at a conference things oh, like that that I think that's uh, that's sadly missing is how, what his sense of humor was like because he he definitely had a sense of humor and uh, he's a very funny guy very smart guy actually um, I mean Calvin knew trigonometry okay so he he wasn't just a country bumpkin. Uh, he was he was a smart guy, very sensitive fellow. Um, I uh, I ended up, you know, by the time I was writing the book, I saw him very much as a heroic figure. Actually, that he had he was a, he was a survivor of something awful. You know, um, uh, I don't know what happened to him. I wasn't there, uh, but I do. I'm convinced that something happened to him. Uh, very similar to what he described now what it was i i can't really hazard a guess because i you know i wasn't there but i do think that it's interesting that he and um, and charles charles hickson were in this together and they both came away with two very different points of view uh, charlie ended up being kind of a contactee in a way he saw it as a much more positive thing but you know calvin was definitely an abductee you know, he resented it. It uh, it basically ruined his life. Uh, he had to rebuild his life several times over. He would he would be working in a town, and suddenly would someone would recognize him, and say, hey, "You're the cow. You're that guy that the Martians ki you know kidnapped and stuff like that." And he'd quit the job and move his family to another town, and that just kept going on and on and on throughout his whole life. Uh, but he held, you know, obviously he kept himself together. And uh, was a successful fellow. And I find it interesting that he moved back um, to an area in Mississippi, not too far from where this happened, uh, not too far at all. Um, I never, I asked him why he did that, since it was he considered it such a negative experience, and he was real quiet before he answered me. He just said, "You know, I never thought about it. I don't know why I did it." And he seemed to be utterly, you know, perplexed. Like, why did I come back here just all of a sudden, you know? Um, but uh, I, I, as he got older, he told me that some, a lot of the resentment that he felt about it was, was dissolving. And he just wanted to know what happened to him. You know, that's all he wanted to know. Uh, he, Unlike, you know, some contactees, some abductees, Calvin really had no answers about this. He didn't know what he's, you know, he, he went to his grave really not knowing what this was. He had people trying to convince him that they were demons and he didn't believe that. As far as aliens go, he said he just didn't know. He didn't know what this was. And that's about as honest an answer, I think, as uh, an experiencer has ever given. Uh, when it comes to this, you, you know what I find interesting. Uh, I, I find uh, really interesting is that the 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 the, the surrounding 
things that uh, Philip and Irina were able to put together um, mm -hmm. uh, surrounding this case. Um, there were there's a lot of different stuff because I've interviewed Dr. Scott um, a couple times uh, regarding mm -hmm. this case. So it to me, I, I love this case. Like, okay, so here here are some things that went on. Supposedly, there was a UFO flap in 1977 that 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 people witnessed. There was a a loud sonic boom that happened that. Uh, that Dr. Scott told me went over a couple states. Um, then there's the case. There's the case of the the Blairs, the family that supposedly got abducted as well. That were I guess right across the river or somewhere near. And the, and and the other other people that witnessed um, craft that night as well. Um, so and and I and I think there were other things too. I just they're not coming to my mind right now. Like, did you what did you think of all that different stuff? And did you take that into consideration when you were writing the book, or or did you focus more on the story of Calvin? There's some of that in the book. Um, some other witnesses and uh, that that saw you know weird things in the sky and 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 I, and I want to stress that that what they were what these other witnesses were seeing we're not talking about a light in the sky that might have been you know, the planet Venus. We're talking about something that was like treetop level, very low, yeah, uh, yeah. kind of egg shaped um, that had a, a bluish light that, that shined out of the bottom of it, um, made no noise, uh, seemed to be made of metal, um, was smooth skinned. They, there was no rivets that were visible or, or, or anything or you know angles or wings or a tail a rudder anything like that um and uh, you know about the size of uh, of i think uh most of them seem to say about it was probably about half the size of like a city bus is what everyone was saying so it wasn't something terribly large um and that's very close to the way you know calvin described the craft that he and he and Charlie encountered, or or maybe I should say the, the craft that encountered them, because it seemed to definitely come after them. Yeah. Um, well, I, we've been going about an hour. Do you guys have any final takeaways? Is there anything else you guys wanted to say about the case before we uh, finish up? Or Well, I, I do think, uh, especially with all the work that Philip and, and uh, Irene are doing, that it's, it's, it's close to becoming, if it hasn't already exceeded it, the, the the most documented UFO encounter ever, I uh, as far as a close encounter of the third kind, anyway, uh, or even fourth kind, as it's become now known now. Um, if there's another one that's more documented, I'm not aware of it. Uh, there's the Betty and Barney Hill case, of course, which has got a lot of, a lot of documentation too, but I think this one's even more detailed in, in what they're finding out and more witnesses, you know, certainly. Um, but uh, it's a fascinating case. I don't think it's over with yet. I think there's going to be more stuff to come out, you know, eventually too. To me, that's awesome. I, I would, I would, I, 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 that's amazing. Like, I, I hope stuff does come. I, I hope he gets vindicated. I don't know how he could, but you know, like, I'd love that when I'm, I'll just, the, the, I, I should say this. When I met Calvin, he was the nicest guy in the world. You could tell he was mm -hmm. like the most, benevolent person like you know like he seemed like he'd give you the shirt off his back like that's yeah. kind of why like when he passed away I, I felt really bad I remember I was doing a live stream when it happened and someone someone told me someone sent me a message and I, I was like it, it might it, it like messed me up like I was like really upset about it like I, I just felt really bad because I started to think that we're starting to lose a lot of like the UFO legends like we lost uh, John Lear. We lost Jordan Maxwell. Um, you know, uh, it's it's just it's sad to see my hero like heroes go. You know, I don't know. Right. Yeah. It, well, it, it messed me up too. You know, because I'd got to know him pretty well, and and I, I think it's pretty fair to say that you know that uh, we were friends. Um, it and it it I think the the thing that bothered me the most about the whole about you know about him passing away when he did is he, you know, all these years and everything he went through and he still didn't have an answer, you know, for what this is. Uh, he did tell me that he felt optimistic because of how things are improving. You know, the stigma has been removed from a lot of this, um, uh, at least 
UFO sightings. Uh, occupant sightings, uh, that's still a little, a little considered a little crazy outside the box. But you know, clearly, um, there's been there's lots and lots of occupant sightings that uh, people aren't aware of. I think that uh, uh, Jacques Vallée said that in um, France alone in the 1950s, it was something like over a thousand reported sightings, and most of them probably you know weren't reported. So what, what in the hell is going on? You know, it's like this is happening all over the world every day. Yeah, you know, this I, is I, a rare I, thing. I, I was I, I just <laughs> wanted to tell you, tell you guys I'm I'm a big fan of uh Stan Gordon as well. Like he's, yeah, yeah. he's he's from my home state of actually like Stan lives like two or three towns over from me because I'm from Pittsburgh and then Stan <laughs> lives in Greensburg, which is like really like close. And I was on his website today and he has he has encounters on here. Like I'm, I was looking at one earlier. There's a, it's a, it's a solid black triangle or UFO UAP hovers over low Pennsylvania building. And he has like multiple ones of these. And I'm not, I get upset because I'm not seeing any UFOs. Like I don't want to get abducted, <laughs> but I'm not seeing any, like, I don't know what I have to do to, to, to see them, you know? Yeah. But it's uh they're around uh, uh, my wife. Um, uh, was coming home from work one day and saw some strange things in the sky and daytime sky and uh, managed to get some things on video. And they're really strange. It's, it's, it's uh, these little, you can't, can't quite tell what they are. It just looks like little specks of, of metal at quite a distance, but they're just zipping around in the air so fast that uh, the way the video on her phone picked it up, it it looks even stranger, you know. But she explained what it looked like to her, to her, you know, naked eyes, um, and what that was. Who knows, you know? When I was a kid, uh, about ten years old, nine or ten years old, I saw a, a flying saucer myself without knowing that I shouldn't be, you know. <laughs> and so there it was, just me and a bunch of my cousins just saw this thing hanging over the over the the woods, you know, just kind of hanging there. And they'd kind of back up and go away. We couldn't see it anymore. Then it would come back, you know, and it went on probably, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. There was a house on, inside the house. There was a kitchen full of adults and we couldn't get a single adult to come out and look at it, look for us. We're like, there's a flying saucer. I said, come on out. No, nobody even looked out the window. Wow. So they just completely dismissed it. Very frustrating. <laughs> Uh, but that kind of changed my life in a lot of ways. I think even at that young age, I started thinking, you know, what's going on? You know, it, it I remember it looked just like, um, uh, well, very, very similar to, to the Jupiter two in the, the original lost in space show. That's kind of what I was, you know, what we were seeing. Um, yeah. I some of what, also, I was going to say, I, I, it's, I, I agree with you that they are around. Like, cause I, I have this girl from Canada. She, uh, she, she's come on my show before, but she, she, uh, she sends me videos every day. She goes out at night and she'll just put her headphones on and listen to music. And then she'll start filming the sky and she gets there. I don't know what else to call them. They're UFOs. You know, that they have weird lights. I, you can tell it's definitely not a plane. And they're hap she she's somewhere like near Montreal, you know. And I asked her, I said, do you live on top of like an elevation or something like that that you're getting, you know, because like it's 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 in strange. And then she got an amazing shot of the moon where it looked like it was burning. Like it was it was like the most amazing moon photo I've ever seen in my entire life. Like um, so I don't know how she catches this stuff on film and I can't even catch stars, you know, it's, <laughs> but I, I'm not doubting her at all. I, I think it happens. I, 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 I'm a born. I know my name on YouTube is typical skeptic, but I'm more of a believer. I'm skeptical, but I'm open-minded if that makes any sense. I think it's important to be skeptical. Mm. Gotta be discerning I, and objective. <laughs> yeah. But I also think it's important to keep an open mind. <clears throat> You know, but uh, but skeptical, being skeptical, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Mm -mm. Yeah. Did you have any uh, last takeaways from what we were talking about, Brent? Well, um, uh, I was thinking about you know the soon after uh, talking to Will Jima back in '75, I remember coming back here to Waynesboro, Tennessee, going to the library and finding uh, some information about Pascagoula this uh this legend of uh, that uh was in this book on folklore 
And it was about Pascagoula, Mississippi and the river there. And uh, uh, a story of a, uh, a missionary who saw this Indian tribe that um, would would report this woman in the river that would sing these beautiful songs. It kind of had a kind of a hypnotic effect on the the natives, and how one one night I think the story goes the full moon, she appeared in a big column of uh, water coming up out of the river, singing to the natives, and they all walked into the river and drowned. Um, now I have read and it was a reference John Keel made to Pascagoula River that people even today. They call it the Singing River, and uh, hearing strange buzzing noises, uh, whatever that is, I don't know. But there's that legend, and then um, here in, uh, well, uh, actually, Martin lives just a, a really a short distance from where I do. He do he's down in uh, I'm close to the Alabama line, and he's down around Florence, Alabama, and uh, near there, there's a, a gentleman. Uh, who passed away a few years ago, but it's Tom Hendricks. And his great-great-grandmother was a uh, full-blood um, Yuchi Indian who uh, who was a healer. And uh, she got removed to Oklahoma back, I think, around 1832, forcible, forcible remover. But she told about out there in Oklahoma, the rivers had no sound, no music coming from them. The, there was no singing from this, uh, you know, sacred woman. And they called it the Singing River, just like uh, in Pascagoula. And he told me that, uh, Tom Hendricks told me that the there was a, a, Nat, a Natchez woman that had told him about the legend and uh, said that she was glad to come up into the river to get away from the Great Salty Lake, which was, of course, the Gulf of Mexico. And... Um, so there are all these legends. I thought it was really interesting. I don't really know what to make of it, but that we have, uh, you know, Indian legends seemingly here and then down that legend down in Pascagoula from got the Tennessee River, the Pascagoula River, the Singing River connection. Um, and, uh, and there were certainly uh, a lot of uh, UFO sightings in the papers the, the news media was reporting on in and around Pascagoula at the time. And uh, as I started to say a little while ago, I was, uh, this Milton Scott drove me up toward Jackson, Mississippi on this major highway. And uh, there was a uh, state trooper uh, station on the way. So he stopped and I went in and asked him about if they'd had any reports of UFO and he said, yeah, there was a trucker came in and he said he'd seen a, one of these objects land on the side of the road or in the road. Can't remember now, but anyway, I was excited and I said, Oh, can I see the report? Oh, there is no report. He said, the guy didn't have any proof of it. He was the only witness. So we didn't write it down. <laughs> you know? And I thought, dang, you know, what if something came up later, whatever, you know? Um, but that's, that was the added, that's the attitude for years of a lot of people. Um, and there was certainly, a lot of cases back then, I remember, I think it was a day before the Pascagoula incident, there was a, a policeman who was responding to a call and there was like, he called it a giant flying hamburger in the sky. And it was creating a uh, humming sound of some kind. And he, uh, I think recorded about a minute of it. And uh, that should be on the, still on the internet somewhere. But there's a, uh, there were just a lot of stories. And then the and in the river itself, the Pascal River, there was uh people that claimed they had I think this this was after the Pascagoula incident where maybe two weeks later, um, and Martin may may know this, uh claiming they saw this craft that was under the water and they even took an oar and struck the top of it and they were trying to uh keep up with it and eventually uh it got away from them mm -hmm. and i think they called the coast guard i'm not sure if they saw it too or not but anyway yep yeah, they they did actually they pursued it and also hit it with an oar and it went it went you know cling it was metal uh, when they did it so yeah yeah there's and there's a, an official report of that from the coast guard yeah very a very peculiar thing you know um and uh 
And I know that uh, it was just years later that uh, this couple contacted, uh, you know, Calvin, because uh, he'd been on television uh, telling about his experience. And these two locals finally came forward. Um, and this story was then investigated and is in, you know, has been since brought to light. Uh, something that was in the water, this was right across on the other side of the river from where, uh, you know, Hickson and, and, and Parker were having their experience on October 11th. And they were having their own experience over on the other side with being swimming in the water. And uh, I think the husband was kind of holding back, but it was mostly the wife telling about what she had seen. And then the, the, before he died, he, you know, revealed that he had been seeing a lot more than he had previously told. And um, uh, I think he observed more than just one being and it was not just a diver in the water it was uh these alien type creatures again martin if there's something you want to add because i'm just kind of <laughs> going <laughs> kind of a little bit what i remember here <laughs> no, no i think hey, you're doing great um uh that i i that's one of the reasons why i think uh that we haven't heard the heard the last of it yet i think there's uh there's more to come more people are going to uh, you know, as as, it, as the stigma continues to rise from this, um, more people are going to feel more comfortable, especially those that are getting up in years, you know, are going to get more comfortable and want to talk about it while they can. Uh, you get to a certain point where you just don't care if people laugh at you or not, you know, and uh, I think some that's what happened in that instance. And I think I, th I would be at all surprised um, for other people to, to come forward, too. There might even be something that we don't know about yet that uh, would actually count as genuine evidence, you know, a really good picture or something uh, photograph, which, uh, you know, photographs are not really evidence in of themselves to me, especially not these days, but if there was something there taken was something. back in, in 1973, like, you know, I, that'd be interesting to look at. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, they weren't into uh, CGI like we are today. No, <laughs> All no. That stuff. And, uh, yeah, it's, but man, it's been fifty years now—a little over fifty years. Yeah, um, yeah. Since that happened. Yeah, wow. the 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 graphic novel was actually part of. The, we timed it to be a sort of a fifty-year anniversary of the event. So, um, uh, so that yeah. that was one that was one of the reasons why why we did that too. That's and, and Philip Mantle has been, you know, he's been focused on this one case. Um, a lot um, obsession. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I mean, th <laughs> there's is. been at least two previous books that he's written. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Calvin wrote wrote two books himself. Um, they're both like phone size phone book size bo books. You know, they're they're huge. They're massive things. Um, so it 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 it's just something that uh, I think grabbed hold of Philip, especially once he really he really got to know Calvin, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, Calvin impressed him so much uh, that he wanted to, to, you know, get the shovel and just start digging more. And so I, I imagine there is a kind of an obsession there, but hell, I, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that you and I are obsessed too, or we wouldn't be doing this for so long. <laughs> oh yeah. I know I'm obsessed and I know it irritates my wife sometimes because we'll be, you know, when we'd be traveling, like I'm from Maine originally, we'd, would take off from Tennessee and go up to Maine and no matter what route we took, uh, we'd be going through a town and I'd say, Oh, you remember back, uh, such and such a time there was a report of a, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Just keep going. <laughs> 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 Afraid that I might pull over and, you know, <laughs> Oh yeah. 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 But, yeah, uh, it, 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 it's hard to let it go. You know I mean? I mean, and when you consider that, that uh, I mean, you've been at it longer than me, but you know, it's not been a short journey for me either. It's been probably close to thirty years, mm -hmm. and um, and 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 I'm no closer to any to knowing what's going on than I ever was. You know, if anything, I'm more confused. Yeah, I keep thinking about 
John Keel's business card that he had, you know, where uh, it listed, you know, his name and he was a photographer, a journalist. And, and in the middle of it, I think, was the, the statement, not an authority on anything. So, <laughs> I mean, your options are wide open at that point. You, know? you, got, right. to meet, you got to meet John Keel, uh, uh, Brent? You, you got no, to... I did. I, uh, I began corresponding with him back at, uh, you know, um, in 1969. And so I was still a teenager and, and uh, I, we shared quite a correspondence and I talked with him on the phone, uh, even got a, we even exchanged a little bit on emails uh, before he got disgusted with using uh, the internet. He, he didn't like the internet. Uh, he said, I'd rather go back to what we did as kids when we used to have two tin cans and a string between them. He says, I, <laughs> I, <laughs> he says, I hate the internet. He didn't like the telephone too much either. Um, no, no. Uh, a couple of times that I talked to him on the phone, he was, uh, uh, he, he just, he, you know, he, 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 he would get real quiet sometimes and just say, I haven't had good experiences with the telephone. And he used to leave these uh, wild messages. If he wasn't there, uh, he had the answer machine. And I remember one was, uh, um, I'm not available right now. I'm, I'm out in a dark alley shooting at civilians. Uh, uh, when I have time, I'll get back with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. We well, you know, you, you know, Brent wrote really the definitive book I I consider on John Keel. Um, it's not really a biography so much as it's just sort of uh, a uh, you just kind of you know step into his shoes a little bit, and kick around in it. Uh, and I thought I knew quite a bit about Keel myself. I've read most everything he's written, but there's a lot in that book I did not know. And it really brings, uh, Brent's book really brings uh, John Keel to life too. You get a lot of more sense of his personality in that he was, uh, he was quite a character. There's still a, um, there's still an Art Bell interview too. If you, if you look it up, you can find it. It's uh, John Keel and Art Bell. It was released the day the Mothman Prophecies movie came out. Uh, so Art okay. Bell interviewed him on the day that the Mothman Prophecies movie came out. It's pretty good. I, I liked it a lot. You know, it seemed to show a lot of his personality. I uh, that that's the most I know about him from that interview. And been talking to Brent when I interviewed Brent. You know, well, it was it was it's been really good to actually uh, connect with other people who were influenced by Keel doing the interviews that I did. You know, to get. Uh, not just pulling together all these things that he did and, and his background, but, um, you know, I knew how he influenced me and, and then to get with others. And even since then, I mean, that was in 2019, the book came out. Uh, I could do another one uh, book because um, uh, I've been interacting with other people and getting more insight into um, things that, you know, Keel was involved with his, um how he affected people sometimes uh i was told infected people um uh, you know he uh some some people felt that he didn't really treat them right uh so there's a whole other you know area areas to yet to be talked about but uh mm -hmm. i've been having a lot of conversation on a lot of different cases uh psychic and ufo is uh peter jordan who was very involved uh, in in the UFO and paranormal field back in uh, for years, and uh, we'll get on the phone sometimes three three and a half hours, and just uh, you know early early morning and just discuss these things. And he knew Keel quite well. Um, he used to visit him and talk with him on the phone. He would uh, he was primarily at the time uh, interested in in uh, the cattle mutilation phenomenon, and he would call uh, or visit with Keel, and and they'd you know. He'd find out different uh, aspects that Keel was familiar with, what his, you know, what knowledge he had, because he was, uh, you know, connecting with all these major people in the cattle mutilation field and went out to Dulce, New Mexico, and, uh, uh, you know, looked at a lot of the evidence. They had spent about a, about a week out there and, and uh, was going to write a major article. Um, on that and uh and then suddenly the uh magazine they was going to write for um said well we're sorry we uh 
we've got word that we're not going to use the article, but you can keep the uh, the money that we paid you in advance, you know. And uh, he noticed uh, there were a lot of <clears throat> a lot of people uh, who were going around and doing these interviews, and then suddenly they got shut down. I always wondered about that. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think what it's because the, the the cattle mutilation had something to do with the government? He uh, he mentioned that on Art Bell when he was with, uh, he said that he thought that he he said that he, there there was a case where these ranchers actually sued the government and won. That's what he says on the Art Bell interview. Well, yeah, he uh, <clears throat> he really did think that the you know we couldn't really. In fact, we did a um, interview. Uh, with Christopher O'Brien, who wrote, you know, Stalking the Herd and and, and uh, Mysterious Valley and such. And, and he, you know, he really suspects, too, I think, that a lot of this, you know, you can't say that none of it's alien, but then you can, you can't say that, you know, the government wasn't involved in some or, or some kind of groups, earthly groups. Uh, <clears throat> they were interested in the proximity, as David Perkins, uh, who just passed away a couple or so months ago, uh, revealed about a lot of these mutilation sites were also close to uh, nuclear plants and such. And um, there were chemicals that were found at different sites that, you know, um, maybe suggested that uh, there were experiments being done or that the cattle were actually paralyzed and, and dissected to uh, see what was maybe in their, their bloodstream and, uh, made to look like it was some kind of cult <laughs> group instead of, uh, you know, paramilitary or whatever. But, you um, know, the problem <laughs> I've always had with that theory, though, and uh, I mean, I, I don't know much about the cattle mutilations that, any more than what just what I've read. I've never gone out in the field over them or anything. But I've often wondered that if, uh, you know, if that's what this is, or at least part of what this is, that the government is uh, taking cows from these various places. I mean, would they, they wouldn't really have to do that. I mean, they could just, there's so much open space. They could have their own herds there and, and subject them to whatever they think, you know, is going on. And no, we would not be the wiser. We would never know. It, this yeah, seems I, to be I thought about that too, or, or, or they could just go up to the farmer and say, Hey, can we buy one of your cattle or something like yeah, that? Yeah. I mean, Wait, I mean, this right? is, this is, this seems to be intentionally, they they want that they want this found. You know, they want the remains there. They want people to know that this happened. It seems to be a a, a very deliberate thing. That yeah uh, yeah that in fact that was one of the things that was discussed is why though that they would they do it? I mean, it's uh, um, uh, unless this you know they don't want people to know what they're doing, but but yet they could go into uh, some of these meat processing places and purchase you know yeah. Uh, some of this and have it tested that way um yeah i you know it's 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 something that uh no one's really got a handle on i mean it's it's it, it happened uh most of them of course as as they pointed out um uh, they were very actually just like with ufo sightings when you break it all down uh it's the really hard cases of the real small percentage and that's what happened with cattle mutilation someone would have um a cow that would die and because they read it in the newspapers about, you know, other suspicious cases, they suddenly thought, oh, I got one here on my farm, too, you know, or I got several. Right. And, and it right. would turn out to be nothing, really, you know. Um, but, um, yeah. Yeah. The, um, the crop circles. I, I had a woman on my show that studies crop circles. She thinks that, it, that it's like something in the earth that's making the crop circles, that, that the earth's alive. And it's it's making you know because people see orbs above crop circles a lot, and I don't know it's it's interesting right I don't know I, it's like it's so hard to say. Yeah, um, well that you know that's those two guys from the pub with the wooden planks. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They they did all all those tens of thousands of crop circles. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, I yeah. That's well. There's, of course, there's people over there now. Those the real intricate designs they're doing, and they uh, there's people that do it as a sport, you know. Right. Um, but then there's some people who said, "Dang, you know, I was out there." And they claim that while they were creating one of these magnificent uh, forms of um, artwork in the field, <laughs> that uh, 
strange things started happening. You know, there were these balls mm-hmm. of light they would see and stuff. And suddenly they realized, oh, what what is going on? It's because I'm out here doing this that it's uh, act, you know, igniting this response. Um, you know, so, um, and then there's people that go into the the circles and uh, they get weird physical sensations. Uh, they're um, unusual um, frequencies recorded or things. Uh, there's like some kind of an energy going on. I don't know. You know. I know, yeah. right? It's almost like a healing energy. It's 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 strange. It's a uh, it's 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 so it's, uh, this world is so much. I I I I I I I plead the fifth on everything. I I think that's the right term I'm looking for. I I don't know as much as I think. I, I don't I don't know anything. You know, I I because I think like I, it's so mysterious. I think the world's so much more mysterious than we were ever thought or taught. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, it is. I mean, the one of the things that that bothers me when I, especially from when you start hearing uh, so-called explanations from debunkers is that uh, you get the sense, if you ever talk to any of these people in person, that they really haven't looked into this very deeply at all. You know, they've just skimmed the surface of it. But you take any one of the things, either, you know, whether uh, UFOs or, or cattle mutilations or crop circles, let's say, any three of those, and if you dig deep enough, you start finding some really strange things that are extremely, extremely complicated, that they contradict each other, there seems to be no doubt that this stuff happened, but why, how, what's going on? You know, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, and just when you, just when you tend to think that maybe you've got a hold of it, something you'll read something else that just happened that has, that just completely obliterates that theory. You yeah. Know, so. Like Brad Steiger wrote in his introduction to my book, visits from hidden realms. He described how I think he went through about a dozen different theories, you know, and, he thought he'd found the answer and he'd work on the theory and then some piece of evidence would come in and he'd have to start all over again. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then he'd have another theory and then it would get, uh, you know, demolished <laughs> and on and on and on. So in the end, he liked a uh, saying that a, um, a lady who um, was interested in UFOs and someone I had interviewed in the book um, who did sweat lodges and had been involved with the native American community. And as a kind of a medicine woman uh, who told me that uh, uh, on the subject of uh, the truth, it's all according to who's telling the story. Mm. And uh, you know, there's a lot of storytellers out there and yeah. It's, yeah. it's really hard to nail it down. <laughs> I agree. I, I think that's what I said. Um, well, thank you guys so much for both coming on. I really enjoyed talking to both of you. Do you guys want to tell everybody where they can find you and find your books and stuff? And thank you again. This was amazing. Oh, thanks well, thank for asking you. me. I appreciate it. Um, to find me, the, the easiest way really is uh, I'm on Facebook. Uh, it's pretty easy to tell it's me, just Martin Powell. Um, you can Google me as well. I have uh, an Amazon author's page, too, with uh, most of my books on it. Uh, not all, but most. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm I'm around. I don't have a, an official web page or anything like that. I never have. Okay, well, with me, I got uh, I got my online magazine that comes out the first of each month, and it's uh, you can find it apmagazine.info. I'm also on Facebook as uh, uh, Brent Rains uh, R A Y N E S. And I also have an alternate perceptions Facebook page. Uh, I try to keep, you know, that to be my the place where I put all my weird stuff in. But uh, I've I've failed at that. A lot of it's on my Brent Rains page too. <laughs> I was gonna say thank you for letting me post so much in the alternate perceptions Facebook group. I I post I post to about twelve different groups every time I put out an episode, and yours is one of them. I always I always try to try to post in there so thank you it's, it's, it's oh no no problem <laughs> no problem thank you mm-hmm. all right guys i'll talk to you soon it was really nice meeting you guys and and I, and brent you again and thank you guys and I'll, I'll send you a link when i post it yeah great thanks thanks right. again for inviting me i appreciate it all right all right all thank right. you have a good night